Welcome to an experience powered by Pipe TV. Powered by Pipe TV. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Carl T. Rowan. As the new director of the United States Information Agency, I have the privilege to present to you a dramatic document of man's continuing search for dignity. It is a film about the great civil rights march in Washington, a moving exercise of one of the most cherished rights in a free society, the right of peaceful protest. I believe that this demonstration of both whites and Negroes, supported by the federal government and by both President Johnson and the late President Kennedy, is a profound example of the procedures unfettered men use to broaden the horizons of freedom and deepen the meaning of personal liberty. Freedom Now Movement, hear me. We are requesting all citizens to move into Washington, to go by plane, by car, bus, any way that you can get there. Walk if necessary. We are pushing for jobs, housing, desegregated schools. This is an urgent request. Please join. Go to Washington. Negroes want the same things that white citizens possess. All of their rights. They want no reservations. They want complete equality, social, economic, and political. And no force under the sun can stem and block and stop this civil rights revolution which is now underway. On August 28th, 1963, 200,000 Americans came to Washington to demand complete freedom for everyone. This is the story of that day. And I think this march will go down as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, uh, demonstrations for freedom and human dignity ever held in the United States. A giant step toward dignity and full participation in American life and affairs was taken by the American Negro in the capital of the United States on the day of August 28, 1963. The step was taken solemnly and in union with many of their white countrymen. So even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. A few months earlier, racial tensions in the Deep South had erupted. News reports carried brutal images of fire hoses blasting at the backs of school children. President Kennedy had finally seen enough. In June of 1963, he presented sweeping civil rights legislation to Congress. Dr. King and others hoped a massive yet peaceful demonstration in Washington would spur passage of the bill. The humble and the famous, Westerners, Northerners, and Southerners. A cross-section of the 50 states were represented as they progressed along the avenue loosely grouped together by states, or organizations, or busloads. We're going to march. We're going to walk together. 
We're going to stand together. We're going to sing together. We're going to stay together. We're going to moan together. We're going to groan together. And after a while, we'll say, freedom, freedom, freedom now. I have the pleasure to present to this great audience young John Lewis, National Chairman, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, Brother John Lewis. We march today for jobs and freedom. But we have nothing to be proud of. But hundreds and thousands of our brothers are not here. But they're receiving starvation wages or no wages at all. While we stand here, there are sharecroppers in the Delta of Mississippi who are out in the field working for less than $3 a day, 12 hours a day. While we stand here, there are students in jail on trumped up charges. Our brother James Farmer, along with many others, is also in jail. We come here today with a great sense of misgiving. It is true that we support the administration's civil rights bill. We support it with great reservation, however. Unless, unless Tile 3 is put in this bill, there's nothing to protect the young children and old women who must face police dogs and fire hoses in the South while they engage in peaceful demonstrations. 150 members of the Congress of the United States arrived at the rally to add their support and the support of the people of the states they represent to the spirit of the march in Washington. The president's active concern with the progress for the Negro in housing, education, and employment is well known. Chairman A. Philip Randolph reports first. We believe that it's going to have its effect on the image of our country all over the world because it will indicate that not only are Negroes struggling to achieve a transition from second class to first class citizenship, but that our white brothers and sisters are marching arm in arm with the Negro citizens of the country for the purpose of achieving this objective. And consequently, this is and has been a great American experience. Beautiful day, not a cloud in the sky. As far as the eye can see, there were just people. It just blew everybody away. We had no idea there would be 250,000 people there. Mothers with babies in strollers, church women with their church hats and, and pocketbooks and fancy shoes. And It was uh, walking down the street like you were moving as part of a glacier. At that time, the largest assemblage of people in one spot in the history of the United States. I had no expectation that I was preparing to step into uh, an event that was going to transform my entire life. To be face to face and side by side with people who had made decisions to go up in the face of the police state atmosphere of the Deep South in order to get change uh, was an overwhelming thought to me. What I was looking for was the spirit, what uh, Dr. King called the beloved community. We had never worked on anything of that magnitude. Finally, there was going to be a coalition of, of the civil rights groups, which is what we had been hoping for for many years. We had a sense that we had slogged through some very terrible things. It, when in a way, there was a huge release on that day. I think there's sometimes when you know something is going to be historic. I remember it was hot. I remember what I was wearing. I remember singing. And I remember that ocean of people. I've never seen anything like it. I remember the electricity in the air. Of 
music had become the uh, soundtrack of the American conscience, and particularly folk music, more than, more than anything. And it was everywhere. Whatever the perfect storm was that made civil rights, uh, anti-war movement, the music, the Woodstock, it then included all ages. And when people heard that, and they sang that music together. It provided for them a moment where they weren't simply an audience, they were participants. Even if they go along with their daily lives, they can say, I'm a part of this, without being you know, a card-carrying member of some organization. Many of the speakers were people whose names were familiar, but you never would get a chance to see them. It wasn't just that they were sympathetic and very much involved in the ideals of the struggle. It was that that's who they really were. Uh, and they were artists and they were superstars. And that you could be both. A powerfully received force and you can say the right thing. You can have a moral point of view. I've always resented people who said it was a picnic. It was a day of solidarity. And as a byproduct of that, they saw wonderful things. If you've traveled all night on a bus and you see Harry Belafonte, that's a nice thing. Or if you hear Bobby Dylan sing. But nobody got the same reaction that John Lewis got in his speech or that Dr. King got. I was aware that this was a time that John Lewis and Dr. King, they were coming into their own. As this is the first time most white people watching this on television had ever seen Dr. King give a full speech. So it was sort of breaking barriers to under, white people's understanding of the civil rights movement that could not have been done probably in any other way. Everybody's not equal. Everybody can't vote. You know, don't have the same shot at raising a family uh, with a future. I, I resolved at that moment I was going to be active. I was going to be a part of changing the country and uh, raising these demands and lifting my voice with, with people who uh, were doing everything they could. It was a procession of church. It was never, ever a march. It was a congregation that uh, had, was answering the call. Not the speech in itself, but the gathering that the speech was being given for the gathering. We shall I, I couldn't believe it. You know, you know, I've been there for a whole week, and we worked in the office, we've done all these things, and now to see black, white, you know, Hispanic, you know, all religion uh, being there, it was a, it was a very touching moment for me. us, in the end, of the day was a complete win-win. Kennedy's heaved a huge sigh of relief that there was not one act of violence. And uh, to see at the end everybody singing, we shall overcome, and all the arms linked. And we've said it often, but it's worth saying as often as necessary. There wasn't a dry eye in the house. I went from first grade through 12th grade and learned practically nothing about black history. I mean, nothing. I always liked history. And uh, so I knew that March on Washington was going to be a historical event, so I went. It's all been a, a progression. A movement that just keeps going. requesting all citizens to move into Washington, to go by plane, bus, any way that you can get there. We are pushing for jobs, housing, desegregated schools. Byron Rustin and I got up early in the morning and we went out to the mall. There was not a soul on the mall, no one. 
And Bayard turns to me and said, Cortland, do you think anyone is coming to this march? And soon as he said that, I mean, people were just pouring out of bus stations, of, of train stations. Into the area that I was assigned to came Malcolm X. I'll never forget what he said because he was not supposed to be there. What he said was, I could not not come. That this was a historic occasion. There was something about that moment when he was talking about why he was there <clears throat> that made the, 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 the march even more significant. I knew by name almost all the people who were speaking. One was Martin Luther King, uh, and then I do remember John Lewis. He is two years older than me. I was 21, he was 23. And I said, he is up there as the leader of SNCC. And what have I done? People need to understand the big issue that black people had to face at that point is, what do you Negroes want? Martin King in his speech said, what people want here is the full participation in the American dream. All the things that you hold sacred, we hold sacred. That was a powerful speech. It's almost criminal the way they have reduced that man to I have a dream. Way well, he talks about our, our full, uh, the founding fathers of this country gave our ancestors a, a promissory note. And we've come here today to cash that check. Now to me, that should be the quote, you know, that is, that is memorized from that speech. You don't hear, hear nothing, any programs and events around the day of Dr. King's assassination. All you hear is, I have a dream. I have a dream. And I think that it's almost criminal because that man was way more than that. The image that we have today of the March on Washington is that the movement peaked and succeeded with the, with the March on Washington. That was definitely not the case, especially the succeeded part. Well, I frankly think it's an ideological effort to convince people that this is over, it's finished. And that's, what, that's the myth that Black Lives Matter exploded. and depth of, of that, that movement worldwide is astounding. You know, and I'm, I'm certainly hoping <clears throat> that something comes out of that, but the one thing that has come out of that was the recognition by the wider community that there is something wrong. For my generation, the thing that got most of us alert and aware and made us begin to really understand what we were dealing with in this country was the lynching of Emmett Till. Well, I think George Floyd's lynching, hopefully, will do the same thing for the current generation. I don't know. It, I, I cried for a couple of days just seeing that as a black woman, as a black person. Um, that's not new to me. The deaths aren't new to me. You think you're going to do something today and see the results next week or next month. You gotta understand that this is, this is, you're in a long range thing. And, and, and you, with your job, look upon it as like a big chain. And every generation must do a share to weaken the links in that chain. Cause the chain is definitely gonna break. But it may not, it may be your great grandchildren who see it break. I'd love to also talk a little bit about your personal or working relationship with life and his passing have affected you? It was a, an act of bravery knowing that you're dying. And he felt the need to go to the place on 16th Street, Black Lives Matter, 
to energize himself, but to also make a statement to these young people. He didn't talk about being a member of Congress. He didn't talk about the Edmund Pettus Bridge. He talked about the importance of being engaged in struggle in a nonviolent way. All of the positive changes that have come have come from people who believed it, kept doing it, kept doing it, kept doing it until there was change. Do not get discouraged. Believe that you have the power to change things. Martin Luther King Jr. was the last to take the stage. He began with a reference to Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, which freed the slaves a century earlier. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. Partway through, King put aside his prepared text and shared with the protesters his dream of equal rights for all. Let freedom ring and when this happens, when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last.